All right, well, my name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and I'm really, really excited uh, to talk to these uh, lovely ladies who are joining us today because uh, we obviously love sharks, but we also need to talk about saving their habitats, right? Which is really, really important because these animals are found in different habitats in the ocean, but coral reefs are, uh, you know, a critical ecosystem for so many species. So if we really love sharks and we want to protect them, we definitely have to talk about protecting the habitats they live in. And today we're going to talk about um, coral reef conservation research projects that are happening in the Bahamas, uh, the shark diving capital of the world. Sharks are super important there. So again, the coral reef systems. And I have two incredible women with me here today. I'm really excited to have them share their knowledge and experience with you guys. Um, before I do a quick intro with them, uh, if you do have questions, we love questions, please put them in the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a section. You can say hello there. Um, we've disabled the chat, so make sure if you have questions, put them in there. And um, I may answer some during the session. We'll save a few uh, to quiz these guys at the end of the session. All right, so first up, we have uh, Haley Jo Carr, who's joining us. Um, Haley is a paddy course director and conservationist. She's worked all over the world, um, currently working with the Reef Rescue Network and the Perry Marine Institute, talking about some of the local programs that she's doing. Um, also an avid diver, ocean advocate, but I think it's really interesting to talk about with both of you how diving um, is so important for conservation. I think sometimes people don't think about scuba diving as really critical and important and as such a powerful tool for marine, all sorts of marine research. And then we also have Katie Storr joining us. Um, Katie is also, as she's a Patty Master Scuba Diver trainer, uh, works on yachts, traveling around, incredible underwater photo uh, photographer and videographer. Again, another incredible ocean lover. I'll let these guys introduce themselves a little bit further once they jump on, but thank you to both of you for being here to share your knowledge and experience with us today. All right, so we'll let Haley, we'll let you dive in and take over and uh, share your work with us, and then we'll follow up and have Katie talk to us for a bit, and then we'll get to those questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you, Jillian. Um, and hi everyone, it's nice to meet everyone virtually today. Uh, my name is Haley Jo, and um, like Gillian said, I'm a paddy course director, and currently I am the coordinator of the Reef Rescue Network, which is part of the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And yes, I've been diving for many years, over a decade I've been diving and working in different areas of marine conservation, everything from sharks to marine debris, um, to turtles and currently probably I'd say for the last definitely about five years I've been mainly involved in coral restoration um, so at the moment that is my specific kind of focus and that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys today about this morning is I want to have a chat about first of all what corals are because I know some of you watching might not be um, might not be sure exactly what a coral is so we're going to discuss that we're then going to talk about the threats that coral reefs are taking are uh, facing. And then we're gonna discuss the reef rescue network. So that's, what is this network? What are we actually doing? And how can you guys become involved with the reef rescue network? So we are gonna just carry on. Can everyone see my screen okay, Katie? Yay! <laughs> okay guys, so what is a coral? And a coral is actually an animal, okay? Some people think that it's just a plant and it's not living, but it is actually an animal. And you can see the diagram on the right there. Um, we've got the anatomy of a coral polyp. So it's a tiny little animal and it is mostly stomach, as you can see there with a the little mouth on top. And then it's got these little tentacles right at the top. And these are tiny little things, okay? Some of them are really small, like sides are like a pinhead. And then there are some solitary polyps that grow up to about 30 centimeters, but they're generally really, really small, tiny little animals. And so one of the individual animals looks like that. And then if you look to the picture to the side, 
that's loads and loads of coral polyps. And those polyps are all connected by living tissue. And what these animals do is they actually live in a colony. So there's gonna be maybe thousands of them within one colony. And these tiny little animals, they are just fixed to the substrate. They create the substrate and they create what you think of when you see pictures of those beautiful coral reefs that I'm gonna show you in a moment. So these little animals, um, you can see in the diagram, what's important I think to note about these animals is how they get their energy source. And the most of the, um, where they get most of their energy from is the algae that lives inside their tentacles. And you can see there in the diagram, it says a thing called zooxanthellae, which is a nightmare to spell. Um, it's a really long word. And what it means is these tiny little algae that live inside these tentacles. And these algae through photosynthesis is what provides most of the energy to these little corals to survive. Now they can also catch zooplankton, other particles out the water using those tentacles. And they actually have little stinging cells on the end. So they can grab particles out of the water and draw that down into their stomach. They're also really sticky. They have like a sticky mucus on the outside and they can also feed by particles sticking to that outside of the coral and then they draw it inside to the mouth. So they're kind of very resourceful little animals. and making beautiful, beautiful reefs for us. So as you can see in that top picture there, um, you can see this one here, this kind of greeny color. So the algae, that zooxanthellae is what creates the color. So coral is actually clear and it's the algae inside it that gives it the color. So this one here you can see is green. It's kind of like a plate like, but look how big this colony actually is. And that's made up of thousands of little coral polyps. There's little or polyps that we showed you. And here, there's another colony here. So this is one other big colony. You've got a colony here of branching corals. So you can see they all look quite different as well. And the bottom diagram shows you that corals can create different structures, different formations. You can have these massive brain coral type uh, structures and boulders. We've got branching corals here, plate-like, pillar. So there's so many different types. Um, and then you can see here, they just make these huge, huge reef structures. So a coral reef is an underwater ecosystem and it's characterized by these reef building corals. Those little tiny coral polyps made these huge reef systems, it's incredible. And they are formed by these colonies of coral polyps held together by calcium carbonate. So they secrete that and then they just keep building on top of each other and once they die, they kind of grow again and extend and they end up building up these huge reef systems. So most of these coral reefs are built from the stony corals whose polyps cluster in these groups. So we have different reef zones as well. So these corals are growing within different zones and coral reef ecosystems contain three distinct zones that host different habitats. So you can see there in the shallows, we have patch reefs. You then go out a little bit deeper and you get to the reef crest. And then further out, you get the fall reef. Now these zones are physically and ecologically connected. So you can see water, seawater, nutrients, and marine life can move around these three zones and they're all, they're all working together in this big ecosystem. Coral reefs, look how beautiful that is. There's so much life within a coral reef. And many people say they're the rainforest of underwater because just look how much is living within a reef. And I always love this fact at the bottom here that coral reefs cover less than 0.1% of the ocean surface, but they are home to 25% of all marine species. Like that's just huge to me. That just really highlights how important coral reefs are, that they're home to 25% of all marine species. They're homes to plenty of fish. You can see there, lobsters, crabs. We've got the corals, turtles, everyone's favorite, the sharks. This is sharks for kids. Plenty of sharks living on coral reefs. So they're really, really important ecosystems, hosting a variety of marine life. And the producers are the basis of the food chain. So things like the algaes and the phytoplankton, 
they're all providing this space and they're providing food for the herbivores, such as gorgeous turtles. Everybody loves turtles. There's parrot fish that live on the reef. These are all the herbivores keeping the reef clean as well. And then the carnivores, such as moray eels and sharks, they prey on the herbivores, which helps keep their population in balance. And when Katie has the talk, she's going to be talking a lot more about why this coral reef is so important and especially why it's so important to sharks. Now, sadly, so we've got these beautiful coral reefs that are home to all this marine life, but sadly, there are lots of threats facing coral reefs. And they're both human and natural. So what I want, there's so many, but I'm gonna be talking a couple of slides worth of threats that they are facing. And one of the biggest threats to coral reefs is overfishing. So overfishing is having devastating effects on our reefs. Um, Lately here, you can see a huge problem here in the Caribbean is even parrotfish are being targeted now, which are important herbivores on our reefs. So overfishing, devastating effects. If we go across to the middle top there, this is actually a souvenir shop that most of you might be familiar with seeing that sells things like shells and corals. Even, I hate seeing it, but things like dead starfish and stuff like that. Like, it's just awful. They're taking everything out of the reef and then selling it as a souvenir. And this is having really devastating effects as well. Bad boating practices. Top right, that's an anchor that's been dropped onto a reef. Now, when the anchor gets dropped down there, you can see it smashes into these colonies. And, you know, some of these colonies take hundreds of years to grow. And these anchors can just wipe them out with one swipe. So that can have a really negative effect. Coastal development can have a negative effect on coral reefs. Bottom here in the middle, pollution. Pollution is having a huge negative effect on our oceans and on our coral reefs. And a sad statistic some people are saying is there's gonna be more plastic in the ocean than fish soon, which I find extremely depressing. And as a diver who's been diving for many years, I do see a lot of trash in the ocean, especially plastics all floating around. And with coral reefs in particular, coral reefs can't move. And what happens is these plastic bags, discarded fishing nets, etc., they all get wrapped around the coral, they smother the coral and it just ends up dying or it can snap it off and break it. So it's really, really detrimental to the coral. Bottom left, another huge problem for coral reefs is climate change, global warming. So these corals, these little animals are really sensitive to temperature and light. And when the water gets too warm, what happens is they start to bleach, the zooxanthellae is dispelled and they turn white. And after a while they end up dying. So when the temperature is too warm, it just kills corals. And you've probably heard about huge bleaching effects that happened in Australia recently. And they're happening all over the world. And it's extremely worrying um, about how corals are actually going to survive this. The next page here. Now, I'm in the Bahamas, so I definitely know about hurricanes. They're getting a lot bigger, a lot stronger. And what hurricanes do is when they come through the reefs as well, they cause huge waves and they can smash up huge areas of coral reef. And because of global warming and climate change, they're saying that storms are only going to become more frequent and more intense, which again, extremely worrying. Bottom left, if you're not a diver, you might not be familiar with this fish really really beautiful but it's called a lionfish and unfortunately here in the Caribbean and in the Bahamas this fish is actually an invasive species so it shouldn't be here which means it doesn't have any natural predators and it literally goes around eating all the fish off the reef so it's extremely bad and it's been decimating fish populations if we look in the middle here Sunscreens. So sunscreens are really bad. So you want to make sure you use a reef safe sunscreen, which is what this picture is. You want to make sure you use a reef safe sunscreen that is non-harmful to coral reef and fish because a lot of sunscreens, when you jump in the water, that just rubs off and that's toxic to the corals and it can also kill them. If we shoot up to the top right, you might be wondering what this is. This kind of animal here clinging to the side of this coral is a crown of thorns starfish. This is really big. These are huge. 
And this crown of thorns was an invasive species in a lot of areas, especially in Australia, over in the Pacific. We don't get these here, thankfully. Uh, but this huge starfish, you can see this area here that's white. That's because this starfish has just gone across eating all the live tissue off this coral. And these um, are really, really dangerous to reefs because they've been multiplying and again, no predators have been killing them and they've been destroying huge areas of reef. Here in the Bahamas, we also have coral predators. We have um, fireworms that eat live tissue. We also have little snails that can eat the tissue. So there are a few predators that if they're kept in check, we're okay. But because if you're taking out some of the carnivores through overfishing, some of these predators, there can be too many of them. And what happens is they can go around then and really start to overtake some of the corals. The bottom two here, we've got destructive fishing practices. So as I said already, overfishing is a huge problem. This picture here is a very destructive fishing practice, which is trawling. And this is a weighted net and it is dragged along the ocean floor to collect fish. And what's happening is it's just breaking and destroying huge areas of coral reef in its path. It's highly destructive. It's a really awful fishing practice. And at the bottom here, just as bad. Um, and I can't believe there's still actually 40 countries that still have dynamite fishing. And what they're doing is they're throwing in the dynamite. All the fish die. They're stunned. They float up to the top. They can scoop up all those fish. But look what happens to the reef underneath. The reef underneath is just completely blasted and destroyed. I said, these reefs could be thousands of years old. They're just completely smashed up just through one explosion. So, oh, and sorry, this one here, the last one. Uh, the last one in this picture was just last week uh, because sadly the Perry Institute for Marine Science, we have just announced uh, through the discovery of this disease has now reached the Bahamas. And this disease is called stony coral tissue loss disease. And it's an extremely um, worrying disease. Now there are lots of disease normally with corals on the reef, but you know, they're all kept in check. They're just kind of normal and part of the ecosystem. But this disease is extremely bad and it's extremely contagious. It spreads rapidly. And once it affects a coral, it's tending to kill about 100% of the coral. It's killing the whole thing. Um, and it's killing corals that are hundreds of years old within maybe three months. So it's a pretty scary disease that we've unfortunately now got here in the Bahamas, um, and it's spread throughout the Caribbean. So there are a lot, sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? There are a lot of things that are threatening our coral reefs, and all these things need to be addressed. You know, there's a lot of things that we need to do to try and help coral reefs um, to stop these negative effects happening. Now you're probably thinking, well, what can I do as an individual? What can you actually do? So there's a lot of things, frankly, on the internet, you'll see on social media saying about what you can do, such as reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, this here I just pulled off the NOAA website. Um, I kind of like this. This gives you 10 ways to protect coral reefs. And you can see on here, there's some things. We talked about overfishing. What can you do? You can choose sustainable seafood. Uh, you can learn how to make smart seafood, seafood choices. And whatever country you live in, most of them, if you Google have, um, this one here is for the States, but lo most countries have a website that you can go on that will give you the best choices to make with sustain sustainably caught fish. Volunteer, this is my favorite. Uh, volunteer, I have an amazing group of volunteers here in the Bahamas. We all do local beach cleanups. We do underwater cleanups. We remove lionfish. That's the most sustainable fish that you can catch. We can actually uh, spear those lionfish and eat them. They taste delicious. And that helps get those off the reef. So there's lots of things that you can do together with volunteers. Now, if you're not a diver, then yeah, you can do a beach cleanup because um, it's just as important to remove all that trash on the beaches so that it doesn't end up getting washed into the ocean. Uh, conserve energy. It's really important for climate change. You can conserve energy switching to energy efficient light bulbs. Make sure you turn off lights in rooms that you're not in and just try and reduce the energy that you're using at home. Definitely never buy corals as gifts. We talked about that as souvenirs. Please don't purchase corals um, when you're on vacation um, as gifts or decor for your house. We talked about using a uh, reef safe sunscreen already. Be a marine debris crusader, definitely. Um, 
don't send chemicals into our waterways. And also here, practice safe boating. So you should always anchor in sandy areas. And if you're a diver and you're out diving, then the boat that you're on will hopefully use moorings. A lot of places are putting mooring buoys in so that the boat can attach to those rather than dropping the anchor. So there are plenty of things there. And like I said, if you just look on the internet, there are tons of ways um, that you can, what you can do to change in your life to help coral reefs. So what I wanna talk about now is about the Perry Institute's Reef Rescue Network and what one thing that we're doing to help coral reefs. So the Reef Rescue Network, it coordinates coral nursery establishment maintenance, management, outplanting, and monitoring with our partners. And our network of nurseries provides an important scientific research platform in addition to restoration benefits. We're providing opportunities to build partnerships between scientists, marine resource managers, conservation practitioners, and businesses and coastal communities that depend on healthy reefs. So what we, the reason we created this network is a lot of places were doing coral restoration efforts on their own, doing different practices. And we wanted to unify that, get that together so that basically everyone's following the correct and, and same protocols throughout their, throughout their nurseries. So you might be thinking, what is a coral nursery? So here's an image of our coral nurseries. And it is just that, it's a nursery where we can grow corals and then we can plant them back onto the reef, which is pretty cool. We've got a tree here design on the right. So it's like a Christmas tree, I call it. It's got all these branches. And then you can see on the lines hanging down, there's a fragment of coral. So that usually starts really small, about five centimeters big, a couple of inches. And then that grows. So we leave it to grow. And then once it's grown big enough, we can cut off the growth and then we can plant it back into the reef. So I'm basically an underwater gardener. <laughs> That's what I do. You know, I'm an underwater gardener. It's like planting a tree to help save the forest. Yeah, we're planting corals to help restore these coral reefs. So there's a couple of different designs. Within this network right now, we actually have 32 coral nurseries and we are growing 6,166 coral fragments. And you can double that for the number of outplants that we do every year because we're cutting off the growth. So we're outplanting a lot more than what we're growing. And we have these nurseries. There's a, most of the nurseries are here in the Bahamas. That's where I'm based. That's where the Reef Rescue Network is based. But we also now have coral nurseries in Aruba and also in St. Lucia. So the network is continually expanding because obviously we want to get as many people as we can growing corals to help replenish and restore those local coral reefs. So as I said, we're assisting in kind of the natural recovery of our coral reefs and we grow the corals in the nursery and then you can see me there with a, with a reef rescue diver. We've got a big basket of corals that we've just cut off one of those nurseries. Then we swim over to a reef. And in the middle picture here, you can actually see this white stuff here is a two-part marine epoxy. We literally just mix it and we use it to stick the corals back onto the substrate. And we stick the coral onto the substrate and then usually it takes about two months and the coral will just completely grow over that epoxy and it'll fix itself to the reef. And then there it's gonna stay forever, nice and happy growing and it's just gonna keep growing larger and larger and making a huge coral colony. And you can see there on the right, this is a big colony here in Nassau. And these corals have grown and they've spread out and they just straight away are creating this really important coral reef habitat, which is so important to the marine life. And it's so great to see when you've outplanted and you, you restore these areas and loads of marine life just starts to come back in and it just starts, all the fish start to come out back. And it's a really amazing thing to see. And then these corals will actually spawn themselves. So once they start spawning, they're already starting to reproduce and make more corals and replenish the area as well. So we're just kind of giving them like a boost um, to actually start them to recover. Um, also, a really important thing to note is that we are, we're planting corals to help create more coral reef, to create important habitat. 
but we are also at the moment trying to save a critically endangered species. So these aquaporid corals, we've got the staghorn coral there at the top, kind of the really, well, they're both branching corals. Uh, you can see because they've got these branches coming out. And Acropora cervicornis is at the top. This one is in huge decline, especially here in the Bahamas. Um, I'm finding it harder and harder to find this one. Um, and this one's extremely endangered, up to 90% um, it's decreased here in the Caribbean, which is shocking figures. The Elkhorn coral at the bottom there, the Acropora palmata, uh, this one as well is critically endangered. They are both listed on the IUCN um, red list. And, you know, it's a pretty scary thought to think that these could be coming uh, extinct. So that's why we've chosen these corals um, to grow in the nursery. So again, replacing habitat, but also helping to save this critically endangered species. So as I said, we have, currently have 32 nurseries. Uh, here in the Bahamas, we have many islands in the Bahamas. And you can see here a lot of the nurseries are spread out all through different islands here, which is great. We just continue to keep expanding throughout the islands. We've also got nurseries in St. Lucia. I'm so sorry, I don't have a river on here. So if anyone from the Scubble Bubbles is watching, we do have nurseries in Aruba. I just need to update my map. Uh, but we have lots of coral nurseries and it's really important to keep expanding because then as these corals are spawning and then their spawn is getting drifted around in currents, then they can mix with different genetics in different areas. So we wanna kind of keep expanding uh, the network, keep having more and more nurseries. So what I want to talk about last is the Paddy Reef Rescue Diver course. So we really wanted to make it like accessible just for you guys, for recreational divers to become involved. So it's not just marine scientists, marine biologists that are doing this coral nursery work. It's actually recreational divers. So if you're watching this and you are not a diver yet, then you need to be a diver because you're watching something you obviously have an interest in the ocean watching this webinar. So I highly recommend becoming certified as an open water diver. You only need to be 10 years old. It takes about three days and then you can dive for yourself on coral reefs and see how beautiful this is. And then you can actually get involved with different marine conservation projects such as coral nurseries. So I've written this distinctive specialty course called the Paddy Reef Rescue Diver course. You do need to be 12 years old to take the course and you also need to be a certified open water diver. And we created this course, like I said, to get recreational divers involved with scientific diving so that you can actually give back. You can be down there looking after these corals in the nursery and you can actually plant your own corals back onto the reef. So on this course, um, it usually just takes one day. It'd be a half day theory session where you're gonna learn about corals. You're gonna learn a lot more about corals than what I've discussed. And you're gonna learn about the bi biology of corals, how they feed, how they reproduce. You're gonna then go on to learn more in detail about coral nurseries. How are they made? How are they created? Um, coral nurseries also need to be kept clean. So you can see the picture there of a diver. She's actually got a little brush and she's just cleaning uh, the algae um, off of the structure. So we need to keep the nurseries clean from algae, from tunicates, from sponges, anything that grows on those um, nurseries needs to be cleaned off. And that needs to be done at least every month. So we, recreational divers and reef rescue divers, they just learn how to remove safely, because we don't want to harm the corals, how to safely clean these structures. You're also going to learn how to plant a coral. And um, you're gonna learn how to plant it back onto the reef with the epoxy. I love the picture at the bottom, I had to put that in. Because I always joke to my students that, you know, when you plant your coral, you have gotta give your coral some love because you want your coral to grow. So this student over in St. Lucia took that literally, gave his coral a little kiss, was like, grow coral. And uh, he loves it, you know, and it's great because you plant these corals yourself and then you can go back diving at that site and you can just watch your coral grow and see how it's helping to recover that area, which is, it's just amazing. So also we've trained 46 reef rescue diver instructors. So I go around training instructors throughout the Caribbean so that they can teach you this course. And within our 32 
nurseries, there are 10 dive shops within our network that actually offer this reef rescue diver course. We have dive shops in the Bahamas, in Aruba and St. Lucia, where you can go and become a reef rescue diver and help out in their nursery. And what you can do, I'm gonna give you my contact in a moment, you can obviously email me if you're interested in this course and I can let you know what dive shops that you can go to. Dive shops desperately need your support as soon as everything opens again, you know, after being closed for so long. So it'd be great if you want to head out to one of those places, take the reef rescue course with them and start working with them underwater in their coral nursery. And I can give you that information. So thank you so much for listening. Um, you can see more about our work. So the Perry Institute, um, we're not only involved in coral restoration, we're also involved in fisheries. We're involved with, we're actually at the moment, we're working a lot with stony coral tissue loss disease. We also provide educational programs. So we're doing a lot of other marine conservation. You can see that on our website. Please email me if you would like to become a reef rescue diver. Maybe you're watching this and you have a dive shop or you have a business or a resort where you may like your own coral nursery, email me and we can chat. I've also put all the social media handles on there. It'd be great if you wanna guys wanna follow the work that we do with the Perry Institute and with the Reef Rescue Network. There's tons of cool pictures, tons of videos, tons of information out there for you guys to have a look at. So I just wanna thank you. And I believe I'm gonna hand you over to Katie now, who's gonna be talking more about why coral reefs are important, specifically in relation to sharks. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Haley. A lot of really important information. And I think I love the message of how people can get involved. That's really important with all of our conversations that we've had about sharks and other marine life is it's just really important for people to understand that there are ways that they can help um, as simple as the sunblock that you choose all the way up to being actively involved in the planting. So thank you for sharing those resources. Hang out. We will do some questions at the end. So I'm going to switch over and let Katie now be our host. Very exciting, Haley. <laughs> I loved it. Right, Katie, are you able to share now? Uh, let's see. No, it says just able. Huh. Um, Haley, you may have to go in and actually make me the host again. So if you go, sorry guys, we're just trying to go back and forth with three people. Um, if you go on my photo where you can see me, there's three little dots at the top. You should be able to make me the host. Okay, one second. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. I'll just replay. Okay, perfect. And now we're going to go to Katie and make Katie the host. Change host. Perfect. All right, we should be good to go. <laughs> oh, yes, we are. It's working. Good. And then Haley, yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, all right. And Haley, if you want to go ahead and mute your microphone down at the bottom left, you should see a little microphone and video. You can shut your video off if you want. You can hang out and you can mute your microphone as well. I can't hear. <laughs> Sorry, we're excited to hear a little bit more about sharks and reefs and how they're connected. So thank you so much, Katie. Okay. All right, hi everybody. My name is Katie, as Jillian said. I am a master scuba diver trainer, as well as a Reef Rescue Network instructor. I'm also a yacht stewardess. Um, shark enthusiast, coral conservationist, really in love with corals. <laughs> so um, this is gonna be quite cool for me to talk about the relation between sharks and coral reefs, which I've actually never had a chance to do this. So this is gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> and thanks Haley for all the information that you actually talked about in your uh, presentation, because it actually goes with what I'm about to say. All right. so. Why are coral reefs important? So a coral, coral reefs are actually important because they're amongst the oldest ecosystems on earth. A 
okay? They exceed rainforest, and that's Haley said, they're actually known as the, re the rainforest of the ocean. So they exceed rainforest in diversity and provide irreplaceable sources of food and shelter for many animals. So if you take a look at the picture here, it actually shows um, coral reef uh, system. So we have some soft corals, which are the sea fans, and then you have tons and tons of fish swimming around, French uh, grunts. And coral reefs actually build the ecosystem. So they create homes for many animals, which would be like the corals that Haley talked about, the reef builders. So the elkhorn and the staghorn corals. So pharmacologists have actually found that an abundance of biomedical compounds are produced by reef systems. So you have these antibiotics, anti-cancer agents, and there's thousands more that haven't been discovered that they're still working on. And they're actually known as the medicine cabinet of the 21st century. So that's pretty cool. Um, coral has, I mean, they've extracted from corals to treat asthma, arthritis, cancer, sorry, did I go too fast, heart disease. And if you check out this picture, the third one to the bottom, you'll actually see that corals protect islands and coastal communities from storms, wave damage, erosion. Uh, the corals and the mangroves actually absorb 90% of the wave energy. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> All right, so in some areas, and actually like in the Bahamas, we have where we have reef diving, snorkeling tours, they actually make up a significant amount of income to these communities, okay? So if you check out the, the third picture, that's me diving. <laughs> and then in the middle is Atlantis. So that's like a coastal uh, resort um, that actually thrives from uh, tourism as well as in some uh, fishing, in some countries, there's actually coral reefs contribute to food. So a quarter, one quarter of the total fish catch provides critical food resources for tens of millions of people. That's a lot. Corals have value, okay? So let's think about that. Um, they provide economic and recreational value. So in this aspect, and Kaylee actually spoke about how they're severely threatened. We're not gonna go back into that because it's, it's quite sad. But mm -hmm. although they're quite valuable in this aspect, they're very severely threatened. So if they were damaged, destroyed, and if the habitat was to be destroyed, it would be unable to support all of the marine animals that inhabit it. So from that picture that we first saw where you had all those fish and all the life on the reef, it basically depreciates the value of the touristic destination. So in terms of like the Bahamas, if our reefs were to get damaged, destroyed, all of that stuff, we, won't, we would lose a, our tourism, basically. So no scuba diving. So as threats increase, let me go to my other side. As threats increase for corals around the world due to climate change, human impacts, it also increased for our apex predators, like sharks, okay, that support healthy ecosystems. The importance of sharks to coral reef systems, it's, they're very, very valuable. If you check out this picture, this is a very good depiction of what a healthy coral reef system actually looks like. You have a shark and you have coral reefs and then you have these tiny little fish swimming around, all sorts of different crabs and other things um, hiding in the coral reef. So it's a huge ecosystem when it's healthy. There's tons of life, okay? Um, so sharks maintain healthy, healthy ecosystems. Um, they actually serve as an indicator to ocean health. So they help to remove the sick, the wounded, the diseased, and they maintain a balance to ensure no species are overpopulated or depleted, okay? Um, sharks promote ecotourism like we talked about earlier. If you check out the picture here, um, the black and white one, that's a tiger shark. Then at the bottom you have a lemon shark, and further over to the right it's a gray reef shark. 
So that's actually a really cool site that a lot of people travel from far to come and visit. So that's called Tiger Beach. It's in West End Freeport. A lot of people actually come there, they visit, they check out the sharks, they get educated about them. All right, I'm sure Jillian's been there <laughs> and Haley. Um, but if you were to remove these animals or any animal from the food web, um, you can have an huge repercussions throughout the ecosystem. Um, if you check out on the slide, you'll see I grabbed some uh, Patty Shark Aware Conservation information. So fewer apex predators, then you have more lower level carnivores. And then if those were to deplete, you have fewer herbivores and more microalgae. So basically the algae would suffocate the reef system. So corals essentially need grazing fish or herbivores to keep the growth of the algae at bay, okay? So sharks in turn protect these smaller fish by consuming bigger fish, so huge fish, or predatory fish, which prey on smaller fish. So if sharks didn't control this balance, there'd be an abundance of predatory fish, eating all the algae fish, algae eating fish, and then the algae eating fish and the coral reefs would be overgrown and suffocated by algae, and then in turn killing the corals, okay? So let's take a closer look into sharks and how they create a balance. So here we have a diagram of how the food web works. So the first thing you have is sun. So the sun gives off energy. We all need energy. Um, the primary producers, which are photo phytoplankton, seaweed, they take this energy, they turn that energy into food, right? And then the herbivores, which is the second level. So those are things like your um, parrotfish, zooplankton, and then after that, you have a, a few levels of carnivores. So you have juvenile stages of fish, large fish, squid, and at the top, of course, we have sharks, dolphins, tuna, all that stuff. <laughs> so let's talk a little more in depth on how each one of these levels works. So we have producers, which is phytoplankton, and those actually, you can only see them by microscope through a microscope. They're very, very tiny and they make their own food. So they take sunlight through photosynthesis and then they turn that light energy into food. So if you look in the pictures here, you'll see there's phytoplankton, zooplankton, bacteria, and then you have the sun. Next is herbivores. So they eat the producers, all right? So they graze on the algae and they keep the algae at bay on the coral reef. So that would be including parrotfish, angelfish, my favorite, tangs, and blennies. If you look at the pictures here, the top one, the red one, that's a spotlight parrotfish. And then you have a blue parrotfish, and then we have a queen angel. All right, so those are all herbivores. All right, now we have our carnivores, everybody's favorites. So big fish that eat lit smaller fish, and smaller carnivores consist of squid, snapper, octopus. Bigger fish and top carnivores consist of sharks, tuna, and dolphins. All here in the pictures. Top is a uh, reef shark. Then you have your snappers, your octopus, and dolphins. So it's important to note that organisms in a community are linked through why they eat and what eats them, okay? All right, so let's have a review of what we actually learned. So coral reefs pro provide sharks with food, habitat for nurseries, protection, which will be uh, like protection from, you know, smaller pups that need to grow and get bigger, or from predators. Sharks provide coral reefs with cycled nutrients, removal of invasive species, such as the lionfish, removal of sick, weak, wounded and diseased fish. All right, so 
Can you actually imagine an ocean without sharks? What, what do you think that would look like? Like, I know I wouldn't like to live in an ocean without sharks. Um, on every dive, mostly when I dive in the Bahamas, every dive I would have the opportunity to see a shark and to see lots of fish and coral reef. I, would, I wouldn't want to imagine what the ocean would look like without that. Mm -hmm. So my last thing I wanna leave you guys with is we are all connected to the ocean, all right? And I want to leave you with a quote from Sylvia Earle, one of my favorite mentors. Even if you never have a chance to see or touch the ocean, the ocean touches you with every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, every bite you consume. Everyone everywhere is inextricably connected to the, and utterly dependent upon the existence of the sea. Okay, so that's the end. <laughs> oh no, I can't get. <laughs> right. All right guys, so thank you for listening. Um, if you guys have a chance, please follow me on Instagram. All right, my name is Mermaid Katie S. And check out my website. I actually have a really cool blog and lots of pictures from my journey throughout the Bahamas diving. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> yeah, well, thank Yeah, okay, good. I was like, is my mic? All right, thank you guys both. I'm super excited. Uh, you can go ahead, we can leave that there or you can um, stop sharing it. Depends on up to Katie, it won't hurt leaving it there. but. Um, yeah, I thank you guys both for sharing so much information. Again, um, at the beginning, for those of you who are here, you heard me talk about we're really focused on sharks. Obviously, Sharks for Kids, that's our program, is, is conserving and protecting these animals. But a big part of that is also protecting their ecosystems, their home. So, um, and, you know, the Bahamas uh, is an incredible place with amazing ecosystems which support these incredible animals. So really, really important. All right, we have some fun questions. So I'll probably go kind of back and forth. Um, this is always my favorite question to ask, even though I know we're talking about corals. Um, Haley, what is your favorite species of shark? <laughs> my favorite shark, um, do I, am I only allowed one? Can I have two? <laughs> uh, you can have two, no problem. I have two. Um, here in Bahamas, uh, definitely the tiger shark. I'm just completely obsessed with the tiger sharks. I love them ever since the first one I saw was in Fiji. Um, but I just think they're absolutely incredible. Just the presence that they have and when you're with them, obsessed. And then the other shark I love are whale sharks. So I dived a lot with whale sharks in Thailand. And again, you know, I still remember that first time I saw a whale shark and just the size and just that feeling. It just completely blew me away. So it's going to have to be whale sharks and tiger sharks. Cool. All right. What about you, Katie? Favorite or two favorites? Okay. I'm going to have to go with tiger shark as well. <laughs> and then hammerhead. <laughs> Beautiful species and and. Also, you know, living in the Bahamas myself, we get so spoiled because we have, you know, all these amazing, all the, you know, the sharks behind me are all photographed in the Bahamas. So, um, yeah, definitely get spoiled being able to see these animals up close uh, so easily. And, and yeah, it's, it's truly an incredible place. So understanding the value of corals and how people can get involved again, super, super important message. And, and thanks for the information. All right, so Martha, age eight, wants to know, and we'll start with you, Katie, your favorite place in the world to go scuba diving. Exuma. <laughs> I really love Exuma. <laughs> um, my favorite place there is actually in the Land and Sea Park. I don't know if you've been to Danger Reef. I have not. No. <gasps> you have to go. It's amazing. Have you been, Haley? Yes? And it's amazing. It is. So I'll put it on my list. I've been to the yeah. exhibits, but only kind of snorkeling, diving, and playing with their sharks and seeing the pigs. So we um, need to get some dives in for sure. Uh, well, in that dive spot, you can you have an opportunity to see a lot of different species of animals. So you've got like sharks, eagle rays, turtles. There's even a coral nursery there. Yeah, like and the corals are like really vibrant too. Because it's protected, so. <laughs> uh, even better. 
All right, and uh, Haley, you've obviously traveled extensively. Uh, do you have a favorite spot to scuba dive? Um, I do. I think my favorite place for me is Indonesia. I, I just am obsessed with Indonesia. I've dived there a lot, especially I lived in Thailand for many years. So it was kind of like the go-to whenever I got time off work, I'd head down to Indonesia. And I'm just obsessed with critters as well and corals. So the coral reefs there are just stunning. And they have the most unusual critters underwater that you've ever seen. So there's just so much to look at. So I, I love Indonesia. Um, for sharks though, has to be the Bahamas. You know, we're a shark sanctuary. There is nowhere I have dived in the world that has the healthy populations of sharks we have. And then with the clarity of the water, you know, this, the Bahamas has the clearest water I've ever dived in. So I do absolutely love it here, but um, for variety is definitely Indonesia. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, again, we're really lucky. The Bahamas, clear water, lots of species, and uh, very, very easy to, to find these animals. Um, but having been to Indonesia and seen the corals, yeah, it's pretty spectacular. It, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, so yeah, really remarkable to see that. But hopefully, you know, the work you guys are doing, the corals are going to benefit and be better and, and come back and, you know, in the Bahamas, um, which would be amazing to see. And just see the entire health of the system benefit from that. All right, so Evie and Elliot would like to know, how did you get into this kind of work? So Haley, if you want to start us off with that. Um, I got into a dive, well, first of all, when I left university, um, I'm from the UK originally. Um, I had all intentions of just going traveling around the world for a year once I left university and then go back and work in the UK. But while traveling, I learned to dive in Australia and I was just hooked. The minute I took my first breath underwater, I was just hooked with diving and the marine life. And I just wanted to do all that I could to protect it. So it straight away, it was like, this is my calling. This is what I want to do. So I became a dive instructor, first of all, so that I could travel around the world, diving all around the world, and also teach others to dive. Because the more people you can get diving, the more, more eyes to see the damage that's being done, and then in turn, more voices to help protect it. So I came through the diving industry route. And then as a diver, I just volunteered. I got involved with as many marine conservation programs as I could. So whatever country I've lived in, I've got involved with coral restoration, with marine debris removal, um, with reef surveys. I do a lot of reef surveys every country I've been in. And I've just done as many courses as I can within marine science and marine biology. And finally, yeah, I've crossed over more full time now into coral restoration. So I still train um, as a paddy course director, I still train instructors, but I'm now full time in coral restoration. I absolutely love it. And how about you, Katie? How did you end up spending more time probably underwater than on land? Well, I got introduced to it as a kid by my dad. So I was actually in the water before I could probably walk. Um, but as a scuba instructor or even a scuba diver, I actually started working at a dive shop um, as an underwater photographer. And then I met Haley. <laughs> And she's pretty, pretty much um, changed the way I think about diving because at first it was just all oh, diving for pretty pictures and now it's actually diving with a purpose. So I look at the reef system a whole lot different. Once I became an instructor, um, Haley was actually one of my, at the time, my what, staff instructor, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I got into coral restoration with her. And I was assisting and helping her manage um, one of the coral reefs here in Nassau. And then after that, it's been history. And that's how I got into coral reef restoration and diving with a purpose. You know, now I see the reef differently. Pardon? <laughs> reef rescue diver instructor as well. Yes, I am a reef diver. I'm actually an instructor with the Reef Rescue Network. So, yes. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of questions about um, from Sandy and from Sarah, both wanting to know, let me just let Sarah know answering. Now, um, if you're, oh, like, I think you kind of mentioned it, but if you are open to partnering with other organizations, um, 
Sandy, I think it asked about in Miami, and then Sarah asked about in Honduras. Um, and they're just beginners in coral gardening and would like to know, you know, other options to formally collaborate. I think you kind of touched upon that, but, um, you know, would it, what would you, anything else is just best to contact you, Haley, directly? Yeah, contact me. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't think we'll be expanding out to Florida just because Florida has completely different laws and, you know, you can do things, develop things with organizations that are already there currently doing it. So I think for the person in Miami, definitely there's tons of coral restoration happening in Florida and all the way down into the Keys. Um, so you can reach out to one of those organizations and start up doing some work with them. Um, Honduras, sure, like we're expanding out to the Caribbean. Um, if you just want to shoot me an email, we can discuss more about maybe what you're currently doing or where you want to go. And then we can discuss possible options of you joining the Reef Rescue Network. Great. All right. Um, what is, someone wants to know, what is the most challenging part of coral gardening? I guess both of you. Um, yeah, Katie, do you want to talk about that? Because you, you've probably not been doing it as long as Haley, but you've learned. So what, what was challenging about learning how to do this? Um, I mean, you refer to it as coral gardening, which I think is cool. But what are, what's something that's too, is, is, it, is it easy? I mean, it looks, looks like it's kind of, there's a lot involved, but what's some of the biggest challenges for it? Um, the biggest challenge I would say is probably out planting. For me, I think um, it's like you kind of have to, once you take it out of the nursery, you cut these fragments, you put them into a bin, and then you have to swim them over. The challenge for me is like when I'm, you know, when you're swimming it over, it's like you're thinking, am I disrupting it? Am I stressing it out? So you kind of have to like really like take your time, you know, especially when you're out planting it and applying, uh, putting the epoxy down and you know, it's, it's work where you have to be very delicate, you know, with, with the corals. So they're very fragile. So I think for me, that's the part that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Haley, what about you? Um, I think the challenge for me is we're on scuba. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm gardening on land. I could be for hours in a garden planting, but we're always limited by the air in our tank, uh, by our no decompression limits. So there's just so much you want to do. And sometimes you're like, I just want to plant one more coral. And you know, you're getting low on air, you've got to start to think about ending the dive. So I think the most challenging aspect is that we're doing this underwater gardening underwater. So We'll, we've got those limitations of scuba diving. So I think that's the biggest challenge for me. Um, you know, the time underwater, I wish we could have more time. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely the restrictions of scuba diving. And the time goes by very fast too, as yeah. you're working, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so Katie, do you have a favorite dive moment? Um, just something you saw or experienced underwater? I have lots of them, but is there one that you can think uh, of? One in particular is actually, I was, I was actually like hovering on the wall, like checking my camera settings and like this massive stool of like running jacks. I mean, it was massive. There was like thousands of them. It just came up and it just swam like straight over me. Like I was in the middle of it, like everywhere they were bumping into me. Um, that was very strange. And I often wondered, like, even when I got out, I was like, what were they swimming that fast from? <laughs> like, you know? Cause there was so many of them and they were going so fast. It happened so quickly. It was like, I saw them and then I blinked my eye and they were gone. And it was like tons of them. So that was a very cool moment for That's me. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Haley? I think for me, uh, some of my most memorable moments are from a, a couple of years ago now. I was fortunate to go to the Galapagos Islands and just diving there at Darwin's Arch and, um, you know, just seeing the hammerheads, you know, hundreds of hammerheads surrounding me. You know, I'm used to the Bahamas with the great hammerheads, you know, just the one or two coming in. This was hundreds of hammerheads and it was just, 
it just took my breath away. That place is absolutely magical. Um, you know, you really feel like you've gone back in time there. So I have a, most of my memorable dives are from that Galapagos trip, just breathtaking. And I think you, know, you guys have mentioned it, and I talk about this a lot, is getting underwater. It will change your perspective on, and it's, I know scuba diving and being in the ocean has changed my life, and it really, it's not like anything we have up in here on land. So for people listening and, uh, you know, if you're not a diver, I, if you have the opportunity to get out there and learn or snorkel or just put your face in the water, uh, it's really, really incredible. And I know these moments that you guys pulled right up, you knew, is because they stick with us and they can be life changing and things with that nothing else is like that. And I think that's really, really incredible. And it's amazing what scuba diving can offer for people or just sticking your face in the ocean, snorkel, uh, a pair of swim goggles, anything just to see that world and to really understand the, the delicate balance, how beautiful it is and just the incredible creatures they have. Um, yeah. So amazing. All right. So, uh, Evie and Elliot would also like to know if, um, there are some corals that are harder to plant than others. The plants. Well, I definitely say there's some corals are harder to grow. Yeah. So the two corals that we're growing that I showed you, the alcorn and the staghorn, they're branching corals. So they grow like branches, like trees. Now they grow pretty quick. So every year they've grown big enough that we can cut them off and plant them. Now, if we think about maybe like one of the massive corals, let's think of like a brain coral, like the big sphere. If you try and grow one of those brain corals uh, by the same technique, let's say I hung it on the branch on the nursery, that might take five years, <laughs> years before it's even big enough to cut. So some corals grow incredibly slow. So they all grow at different rates. And I said, the branching corals are the fastest growing. Um, but the other corals, they grow so slow that, you know, they're really hard to do it throughout the nursery. So there are other techniques that are being used to grow those types of corals, which is called microfragmentation, where you cut them up into little bits and you're, you're growing them in wet labs. So, but for the nursery design, the type of nursery that I'm uh, running, you really can only use the branching corals. Um, so they're the ones that, are, that work really well. They grow fast. And then they're pretty easy. Yeah, just to, you just stick them into the reef. Okay, we'll finish up. Katie, um, I know you guys are both based in the Bahamas, but what would you say if there's one piece of advice for people visiting, what would you, at, like, what would you suggest for them to really be an, you know, an ocean-minded visitor to the islands? Because most people that are coming are probably gonna do some sort of ocean-related activity. Um, because that's what draws them in. But what would you say to people who are visiting the Bahamas as to be a bit more eco-minded or, you know, environmentally friendly? Okay. Um, I'll just, I guess I can talk about what I actually see happening day to day. Okay. And Haley actually mentioned about the sunscreen. Okay. Because that's like a big thing. I've seen that happen over and over. And it's like, the sprays and all that stuff, that's really harmful to the environment. So if you're traveling here, you might want to do some research about, you know, this, the reef safe products. If you're going to be traveling on the boat and using sunscreen and all of that. And then just be mindful of when you're on the boats and you're actually doing activities on the beach that you pick your trash up, you know, and, you know, things like that. Or you, are you stow away things that can fly off the boat, like plastics and cans and things like that? Because I see that happening a lot as I am out on the water. You know, people live and not necessarily do it um, intentionally, but it might just be the fact that they didn't put it into a bin and it flew off. And I've often had to stop and pick things like that up because it flew off of a boat or, you know, and it can be really harmful because turtles would actually ingest that and that's happened quite a few times here i've seen that happen um with turtles and it's it's so sad that it happened so stuff like that um i would say and like i said when you're on the beach make sure you take your trash with you you know don't even if there's a trash can if it's full take it with you because sometimes 
packing that on top of a full trash can can actually cause it to go into the ocean, things like that. Yeah, and, and maybe look for programs where you can do some volunteer work um, if you do have time. Um, uh, I think the Bahamas National Trust has like different um, uh, trails and nature programs that you can be a part of and just get to know nature here in the Bahamas a lot more than just visiting as a regular tourist attraction, you know? Yeah, I think yeah. that's advice for anywhere too, really, is just to being aware of the products we're using and little simple actions that we're all doing each day that can make a huge difference. Um, and, you know, that's really, we're all connected. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Things like that that are just good for the entire planet and all of us that are sharing this space. So, well, first off, thanks to everyone who joined us today. You can, um, if you didn't catch the pages or the information um, for either of these amazing women, you can definitely message Sharks for Kids uh, through our website. I'll make sure to connect that. You can also check our social posts. We've linked, um, if you go to the webinars page on Sharks for Kids, their links are on there. So please follow them. Stay up with lots of amazing resources um, from both of them that you can learn a lot. And I thank you to Katie and Haley, both of you today for sharing your knowledge um, and experience with us. I know I learned a lot. And again, it's, it's so critical for, for ocean conservation to understand these systems and how we can protect them. So thank you both for your time. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone.